I too want to thank everybody. I, I wasn't always sure I was thankful to be here, but I am. It's, it's been a fascinating day. Um, and, and I'll just say in starting that as I kept turning over what I thought I was writing about, it took me a while to figure out that the question I was probably most interested in was just how far and under what conditions photography can show, or as I'll also say sometimes, discover a work as a sculpture, as well as how it might fail to do so. Um, and I've been kind of uncertain about how sensible a question that is, or how sensible my answer is. That's one of the reasons the day was a bit of a comfort. Um, I certainly think it's a modernist kind of question, and that's going to be pretty clearly reflected in the relatively narrow historical and cultural scope of this talk. So let me start with this pair. On the left, we have a familiar work, as we most often show it in the classroom. And it's perhaps worth noticing that we will, under those circumstances, typically introduce it simply as Titian's painting, the Madonna di Capazero. Under certain circumstances, we might qualify it as a reproduction of that work. And we might, under further certain further circumstances specify it as a photographic reproduction, but we're not likely, apart from some very specific pressure to do so, to identify it simply as a photograph. Mostly, it seems to me these days, we'll simply refer to it, the painting, the photograph, the PowerPoint slide, as an image. And that tendency is, I think, one rough measure of the impact of new technologies on our classroom and perhaps also something of a guide to the circumstances under which questions of photography and sculpture now emerge. On the right, we have, among other things, that same painting, but we're much more likely to identify this image right away as a photograph, and as a photograph of a certain kind, a snapshot, more or less, some particular person's photograph of, and here there are a lot of good reasons for some hesitation, of my cousins visiting Venice of a side chapel in Santa Maria Gloriosi, or of Titian's Madonna, or in any number of other ways. Um, I don't know, my parents just before he proposed to her. Right? All of them are reasonably good candidates for what this is a photograph of, and none of them are mutually exclusive. Which one comes to the fore at any given moment is largely a matter of that moment, of some particular context of showing. A slightly different way to put the contrast is simply to note that the main places you'll encounter the image on the left are in art history texts and in museum catalogs. The image on the right is primarily at home in personal photo albums and the like, including now the web, which is, of course, where I found it, along with a myriad of contemporaries. None of those observations are why I'm starting here. I just think there's some good in trying to notice as one goes along where and how a photograph's being a photograph figures or fails to figure in our experience of it, which is also my justification for that little sound effect a moment ago, which is to remind you that we're not now looking at slides, but at a form of digital animation. The reasons for showing this particular pair are more specific and derive from a particular argument about the Titian and Renaissance painting more generally advanced by Thomas Petfarkin in his book, The Discovery of Pictorial Composition, Theories of Visual Order, 1400 to 1800. His claim for the Titian and other works like it is that it lacks pictorial composition, so that we take it wrongly, fail to see what it is and what properly holds it together, if we look for such composition in it. The image, I see I'm on the wrong slide here. Um, No, I'm on the right slide, sorry. Um, the image on the left is one that leaves us nothing to look for in it except its pictorial composition. It's a photograph made under what Petfarkin calls the rule of the tableau. The image on the right comes closer to showing what Petfarkin takes to be the actual fact of Titian's Madonna. Here I tend for various reasons to push his argument in a direction he doesn't explicitly take. That is, I tend to say that if this work lacks pictorial composition, if its essential stakes lie, as Petfarkin puts it, in the creation of, quote, large life-size figures in strong relievo supported by a carefully aligned perspective construction to project themselves at the viewer in a direction other than that suggested by the picture's surface, 
That's because it is not, in fact, a painting, but a painted negotiation with sculpture and architecture, which means that I take my tourist images and put Farkin's own oblique view to be limit cases of the photography of sculpture. I don't expect you will all agree with me that it is indeed such a case. That's what it means that it's a limit case, at best. But my question is what exactly it would be a case of. As a first approach, one might say that the oblique presentations of the Madonna are instances of a photography's discovery of sculpture or of the work's aspiration to the condition of sculpture, a discovery significantly concealed by the photograph made under the rule of the tableau. This would make my initial contrast in some ways reminiscent of a certain modernist contrast Rosalind Krauss draws on in, on in her account of Anthony Caro, but here she is using this contrast to hold Caro responsible for the collapse into the pictorial um, that she takes to be evidenced in the image on the right. A second and possibly closer approach might say that the oblique photographs discover Titian's Madonna as itself a picturing or discovering of its figures as sculpture or as aspiring to the condition of sculpture. So in itself already doing the work of the photograph, which would then appear as significantly reflexive, a particular repetition of its object. But Farkin's own photograph, taken as it were over the shoulder of its single viewer, might appear wittingly or not to press this possibility to the fore in ways the images I've taken from Google mostly don't. And we may, may want to relate that to put Farkin's apparent desire to continue calling the work in question a painting, albeit of a kind distinct from the kind generated under the rule of the tableau, so traceable to something of the difference between the argument he actually conducts and the consequences I draw from it. We can presumably follow all of this back into Renaissance discussions of composition, material over which I can claim no mastery whatsoever. And then we may be struck by just how far such discussions are of figures or figure groups, bodies, understood in terms not significantly different from those of sculpture, and in which perspective functions primarily as a way of placing such bodies rather than as an overarching compositional condition. Perspective working this way would be, as at least some Renaissance texts do indeed pose it, parergonal, not properly of the work, but contiguous with it as frame or ornament. And this may well seem part of what it means to say that Titian's work is a painted negotiation between sculpture and architecture. So but Farkin's account inevitably appeals both to perspective within the painting and to the situation of the painting within the church. Perspective is, as it so often is, all over the place here, exerting its usual push and pull on our counterposed intu intuitions of subjective point of view and objective rendering. Titian is clearly working hard both within and against it in painting his Madonna. On the one hand, he's clearly chosen a particularly marked and notably eccentric perspective that makes point of view an explicit issue. And on the other hand, the donors are rendered frontally with, as Petfarkin argues, the two huge columns serving to confound the difference between these two aspects. Petfarkin tends to view all of this as a compromise between Titian's ambition and the demands or interests of the donors, but that obviously depends on how one characterizes Titian's ambition in the first place. But Farkin locates that ambition in the oblique perspective and ties Titian's choice of it to the conditions under which the Madonna is approached within the church. I don't myself find that wholly convincing because it assigns Titian an ambition at odds with rather than predicated upon the inevitable frontality of the painting surface itself, which the donor portraits do insistently remark, and which intends in its architectural circumstance an audience as fully as the oblique view does. At the same time, it seems to me that Petfarkin already has to hand all the elements of the stronger explanation that Titian was actively interested in making a work with multiple facings minimally both towards its approach and toward those seated before it. Um, and again, I think it's worth noticing the contrast between Pet Farkin's photo with its single viewer, um, which collapses the distinction I'm drawing, and the tourist snapshots, which tend to insist on it. And I'm willing to take it that Titian felt such multiple facing was in a sense necessary 
if his work were not to be mistaken for a painting, if, that is, he felt the incipient pressure on his art of the purely pictorial prospects that would ultimately be consolidated in the French Academy as Petfarkin's rule of the tableau. Or, to put it in more immediately relevant terms, as if Titian feared a certain failure of publicness, of shareability, if such facings were not explicitly secured. One way to put this would be to say that under the rule of tableau, the tableau, paintings exist for a beholder whose existence is built into the fundamental role perspective has assumed in the construction of the painting and painterly space overall. The beholder is defined and fixed by that construction. But the aspiration to sculpture integral to the Renaissance altarpiece assumes, as sculpture must, viewers both multiple and mobile, and it imagines the objectivity of a work to lie not in the adequacy of our view of it, but it's in its essential structural publicness, its capacity to gather us. The particular genius of Struth's photograph of Michelangelo's David, in contrast to his picture of Kaibot's Paris Street or Chima's Incredulity of St. Thomas, lies, of course, in its refusal to show the David in favor of, of reducing it to its presumptive classical essence as a point around which a people gather and for which individual points of view are shared or shared out by the work. Thus, as points of view not at odds with, but in effect guaranteed by its objectivity. Struth's camera stands or stands in for that. And that is evidently a sort of reversal in how the camera is most often taken to show things in perspective, although it's certainly not a surrender of that. The general situation here may remind some of you of Jacques Lacan's celebrated discussion of the gaze in the seminar entitled The Four Fundamental Concepts of Psychoanalysis, and in particular of its central anecdote. I know many of you know this bit of text very well, but I will give you some of it. I was, Lacan says, in my early 20s or thereabouts, and at the time, of course, being a young intellectual, I wanted desperately to get away, see something different, throw myself into something practical, something physical. One day I was on a small boat with a few people from a family of fishermen in a small port. As we were waiting for the moment to pull in the nets, an individual known as Petit Jean pointed out to me something floating on the surface of the waves. It was a small can, a sardine can. It floated there in the sun, a witness to the canning industry, which we, in fact, were supposed to supply. It glittered in the sun. And Petit Jean said to me, you see that can? Do you see it? Well, it doesn't see you. He found this incident highly amusing, I less so. I imagine the small but hardly unusual little social drama is clear enough. Lacan busy identifying with his working class would-be comrades, is being told by one of them that he doesn't fit in. And the message is, as it were, occasioned and relayed by the glittering sardine can, emblem of the social fact that divides them. If he can find a way to get over the sting of it and share in Petit Jean's amusement, he may be able to continue in the boat. I've given this scene the social gloss Lacan's recitation of the story highlights, but of course, it's also and above all a psychoanalytic story in which we are entitled to make out the liniments of Oedipus, baby Jacques, and mama objet petit Jean, and the play of desire that binds them, and then the intervening cast castrating papa sardine can marking the limits of their intimacy. The message remains the same. Lacan's discussion of this anecdote is highly pictorializing, and I'll turn to some of its details in a second. Um, in part because he finds himself using this to engage the late work of Maurice Merleau-Ponty, whose posthumous text, Visible and the Invisible, had just appeared when Lacan was doing the seminar. But of course, what I want to suggest is that the whole situation is at least equally well seen as sculptural. That is, as a situation in which the multiple points of view of an audience find themselves placed in perspective by something exterior to their play of views. This, Lacan says, is the function that is found at the heart of the institution of the subject in the visible, 
What determines me at the most profound level in the visible is the gaze that is outside. It is through the gaze that I enter light, and it is from that gaze that I receive its effects. What Lacan is calling the gaze here is the glittering sardine can, the blind source or mediator of the light that renders him visible even as it sets the conditions of actual vision. The general underlying opposition here between line and light is one Lacan inherits from Goethe and is wrestling with more approximately in Merleau-Ponty. But in taking this as a sort of sculptural scene, it may be useful to think of the blindness Hegel took to be essential to the achievement of classical sculpture. The sardine can is that blind classical sculpture. I've noted that Lacan's gloss on this story takes a markedly pictorial turn, so it should perhaps not be surprising, but still might be striking, that the paragraph I just read you ends with his asserting that, quote, the gaze is the instrument through which light is embodied and through which, if you will allow me to use a word as I often do in a fragmented form, I am photographed. He tries to capture much of what he wants to say in a diagram that ends up looking roughly like this, where the black triangle indicates the opening of a geometrical, geometrical point, in effect the viewing eye, toward its object, and the red triangle indicates the outward projection of a point of light toward the opening of the visible within which that eye is located. That is the place where I am photographed. The place Struth's photograph literalizes. In producing his diagram, Lacan is clearly thinking in terms of two-dimensional representation. It's possible that he has at the back of his mind some thought of the old way movies were projected from behind the screen. There's not a great deal of textual support for that, but he does label a vertical, the vertical line placed at the center of the diagram variously as image and screen. And of course, this may be a good way to imagine the projection you're looking at now, which is certainly not in any sense photographic. Much more certainly, he is trying to produce a diagram that draws on our most general intuitions about pictorial perspective, and in particular, about how such perspective establishes a relation between the viewer outside the picture and the vanishing point within it. And what we might be able to take from that is the thought that sculpture exists at, and I would emphasize at and not as, the vanishing point of painterly's perspective, so at some difficult angle to our normal grasp of it, as in psychoanalysis, the father stands at some difficult angle to our more direct engagements with one another, a fact Lacan's discussion tries to capture within its pictorial limits through an appeal to Holbein's anamorphosis. This is a work that draws on the same projective possibility as Titian's Madonna, but evidently does so precisely in order to underline what is divided within and among us. In this way, it's much handier to Lacan's purpose and it can so also draw our attention to what can now appear as distinctly palliative in the Titian, and for that matter, in the David. They both claim to dissolve any apparent conflict between the individual viewpoint and collective experience. This would be one way of understanding the relative indistinctness of painting and sculpture. How on the one hand, Titian fights for his multiple audience, and on the other hand, the ways in which the David gives itself over to the pictoriality that Wolflin was so insistent on in addressing the photo photographing of Renaissance sculpture. Behind this, of course, lurks a certain primacy of relief, both in the Renaissance and for Wolflin and, and his contemporaries. From the Lacanian point of view, what I'm calling the palliative impulse would be the attempt to transform the necessarily ternary symbolic order with its wholly intransigent and distinctly inhuman other into merely an expanded system of binary imaginary encounters. The simplest expression of this is, I suggest, the story of Pygmalion and Galatea, and that dream of animation and desire fulfilled is certainly one of the strands on which a certain history of photography and sculpture can be and has been strung. So I find the Lacan helpful in getting at some sense of the relation between photography's formal condition and sculpture's social fact, and the difficult matters of recognition and acknowledgement that can traverse that fact. But Lacan's diagrams and the appeal to Holbein's play of perspective finally falls a bit short of the prospect opened up by Struth's photograph, 
which plays out in a way the diagram cannot, a certain misfit between the general logic of perspective and the grids we take to be at standard support on the one hand, and the polar coordinates proper to the David itself on the other. Now you'll notice that I've taken the opportunity of mentioning grids and polar coordinates to sneak in some bits of a practice that takes a particular interest in such things and is notably deft at working their various intersections and divergences, particularly as they are staked in the interplay of photography and sculpture. Indeed, it's hard for me not to see this poster as something like the formal matrix of this talk that's just been waiting for me to catch up with it. And of course, part of what it points to is another limit case that's been lurking all along on the far side of my passing glimpses at Michelangelo and Caro. This is a photo, documentary and in intention, as that word came to be used in the late 60s and early 70s, particularly of photographs presumably wholly given over to the barest existential evidence of their object, of three works by Robert Smithson that I take to be almost inversions of the titian from which I'm started. They are from left to right, pointless vanishing point, leaning strata, and shift. These are difficult works to address. They are not exactly sculptures. They fall about half a dimension short of that. Neither are they exactly minimalist objects. We can, of course, photograph them as if they were something of that sort. And in being photographed that way, they begin to look more like those things. They stand alone, have a finish, can be imagined to have features, and so on. They look like museum objects. I don't mean that they're not, but there's a price to be paid. And Smithson's photo, I think, helps make that price visible. Some points of view are more or less invited. Some effectively drop out, as indeed they typically drop out of one's experience of the actual work. Pointless vanishing point is no doubt the most explicit this way, but they all have, as it were, aspects that are dead or inert, nominally available but wholly inactive. And they do so because as material displacements of representational conventions, they are essentially complicit with their photography. They are in a sense different from but related to Titian's Madonna already photographs. They demand and refuse to be put into perspective they exist only in an as displacement, and I would say displacement in a different sense than the Morris as we were looking at a moment ago. Um, in doing so, they enact or enable a certain continuation of sculpture as photography, certainly a thought that is active all across Smithson's work, but is probably most explicit in his tour of the monuments of, say, New Jersey. This movement of displacement or continuation is like the work itself, hard to characterize. It certainly doesn't amount to photography simply supplanting sculpture, although I think there has been a certain tendency in recent art and criticism to imagine some such passage or transformation. In suggesting that Smithson's objects and photographs or a certain range within them invert the situation of Titian's Madonna, I suppose I can be taken as saying that they bring out the deconstructive force of the relations that enable that, that work make fully explicit the difficult supplementarity embedded in the paragon of perspective. So this paper then proposes, brackets, a certain speculative history of sculpture in or through its engagement with photography. And it's a peculiar history insofar as it begins and unfolds very largely in the absence of any actual camera. So it's perhaps better to say that I've tried to trace out a certain history of mediums in an entanglement with one another that photography both helps make visible and finally participates in, as if in a place marked out for it from the start. I've done so in part because I'm interested in the capacity of one medium to betray, variously to show or to undo another. But I've also done so because I believe it offers a useful angle into more general matters, which can perhaps be put this way. What unfolds both conceptually and historically between my two limit cases is a certain stretch of sculpture, one major aspiration of which, as is I take to be the case for sculpture more generally, to center a community. That is, to establish the conditions under which we can seriously use the first person plural. That's its claim to objectivity. For Renaissance sculpture, these conditions are essentially the same 
as those for the use of the first person singular. To say I is to say we, and to say we is to say I. This is how centrality and frontality are hinged in it, and so is the shape of its relative indistinctness from painting. With the Baroque, for various reasons, sculpture is obliged to make itself for an irreducibly plural first person, and so the conditions of its photographing necessarily shift, not because the sculpture becomes more purely central, but because it's obliged to admit a multiplicity of individuals that can stand only elliptically as a community. The modernist exacerbation of this condition calls forth a sculpture that effectively surrenders any claim on centrality in favor of a more difficult kind of pure externality, a scattering into aspects that cohere only as aspects, thus demanding an explicit acknowledgement of a pictorial pictoriality internal to sculpture that is the formal correlate of our separateness before it, a circumstance in which it is no longer clear how and when I can speak in the plural, unclear who can say we, and in so saying speak for me, thus obliging us to speak each only from our singularity, testing what in that might still carry beyond itself. It is, I think, under these pressures that photography and sculpture begins to appear as a critical question for both art and its history and criticism. And one major line of response to that question, or really bundle of questions, in effect asks photography to stand in for sculpture's impossible objectivity, as if such objectivity could now be guaranteed not in sharing but by knowing. My remarks would then be partly an attempt to derail or complicate that impulse. But it's also the case that the difficulty of this moment has, since minimalism, been shadowed by a simpler collapse of sculpture that gives the question of showing or discovering, uh, discovering it a different sense or shape whose current photographic form, and I owe these images to a more Twitter-prone friend, I take to look more or less like this. I don't know how seriously to take something like this selection from a considerable mass of such tweeted images and I don't know what kind of social fact they represent. It seems to me probably not important that these are digital rather than directly photographic images, but I've already suggested, at least in passing, that PowerPoint and its kin carry an implicit understanding of the images they project as animations rather than as slides or photographs. And it's hard for me not to see these images as participating in some such understanding particularly since sculpture itself and certain imagination of its photographing have recurrently opened in this direction towards the thought or desire for animation. Kuhn's, of course, seems a particularly apt vehicle for this. One can set this shift alongside what seems to me a very similar shift in the self-understanding of film over the past several decades. And in the case of film, that understanding arose more or less in advance of films becoming a fully digital medium. It's a matter, I think, above all, of a certain grasp of interiority as a kind of hollowness in need of filling or inspiriting. In some sense, both these things, the attempt to supplant the objectivity of an object with our knowledge of it, and the appeal to animation come together in the recently released iPad app for Trajan's column that I imagine many of you have seen. It's a remarkable thing, and I've decided to let PowerPoint run sort of amuck with it. At home, or presumably in a classroom, one can call off an animated, three-dimensional photographic rendering of Trajan's column in its graphically rendered setting that allows one to move up, down, and around the column, zooming in and out at will. Other options draw on a similar mix of photography, graphic rendering, and animation to tell the story the column pictures, to produce a similarly illustrated timeline for its history, and to lay out its dimensions and structures. The ad for it currently running on YouTube shows all of this as well as its further capacity to draw on GPS so as to allow you to sit or stand before the work itself and see through your iPad this same level of otherwise unavailable detail. It's an extraordinary thing. It's also kind of disturbing. The YouTube video's weaving of the mixed media of the app with presumably real video of its use in situ is a bit disorienting. But of course, the really odd thing is what the video shows. A viewer holding her iPad aimed at the column, 
thus of course blocking her direct view of it, in order to do something that evidently counts as seeing it. Imagine the Scrucci view of this. She'll certainly come away with a better knowledge of what is there um, to be seen than I will. What's not clear to me is what it will make sense to say she has seen, what her experience has been of. And of course, it's also not, if it's also not clear to her what her experience has been of, that's a very peculiar kind of problem. And yet it would be foolish to deny that the app offers a strong realization that will no doubt become more seamless over time of what we have both often wanted of sculpture's photographic documentation and imagined as its truth. The showing of art, whether we are standing before or around it, or in the more mediated circumstances emblematized by the classroom, is a funny thing. Funny because it's only partly something we do, and in doing it, we're trying to show, first of all, something the work itself does, which is to show itself. As Stanley Cavell put it some years ago, why does the assertion you have to see it mean what it does? Why, on pain of what, must I see it? What consequences befall me if I don't? One answer might be, well, then I wouldn't see it, which at least says that there is no point to the seeing beyond itself. It is worth doing in itself. Another answer might be, then I wouldn't know it, what it is about, what it is, what's happening, what is there. And then what seems that seems to say is that works of art are objects of the sort that can only be known in seeing, in sensing. It's not, as in the case of ordinary material objects, that I know because I see, or that seeing is how I know, as opposed, to, for example, to being told or figuring it out. It is, one, rather, one may wish to say, that what I know is what I see, or even seeing feels like knowing. What Cavell's comments do not explicitly underline is that the quasi-imperative, you have to see it, is one issued not in the absence of vision, but precisely in its midst, over and against what is already available within it. It asks for a twisting of the standing relation between knowing and seeing, and I suppose one can think of this talk as having been, above all, an attempt to show something of that twisting as it works the relations between photography and sculpture. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. There are lights. Um, we have time for two questions. Anyone? A stunned silence, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Suzanne. It's actually a, a, an amazingly minor question, but whatever. Um, and going back to your, your original pairing of the altarpiece and looking at it directly and thinking through perspective and from the vantage point of the crowd. And I'm wondering two things. One is the impact of a certain moment of Baroque and the Counter-Reformation and the primacy of perspective and bringing the viewer into the canvas and the primacy of multimedia in, in, in terms of stone and painting and colors, etc., to have a truly sensor, sensorial engagement with art. And secondly, if you would be willing to posit what is the more correct, I mean, in a sense, n no one really would see a painting slash altarpiece in its totally frontal perspective. Um, and so I think for, for many now and then, the, the truer is the one that, that we, you are identifying as the sort of tourist image. The truer is the tourist image. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's right. Um, and I, I, you know, this is new stuff for me in a way that I've, I've gotten into through weird angles and never really knew it was going to exactly pay out in a thought about sculpture. I was, I was interested initially in all this material for different reasons. But I think the entire question of what is a medium, how do we come to have a medium, how do mediums 
establish relations among themselves is kind of open in a new way. Um, you know, Hegel, early on in his aesthetics, he refers to all that stuff as the individual arts. And so there's room now for a question about how the individual arts become mediums. And it seems to me that Farkin's book is a nice way of opening up that question, which I think the Baroque is the working out of. So that's what's in the background of what I'm playing around here. But yeah, I think the tourists get it right. Uh, that's interesting because it says that work is not, not, to me it says the work is not a painting. And that then becomes an interesting question. What is it? How do you describe that? How do you understand a history of the picturing of sculpture as it emerge, as it is already at play there and emerges subsequently? So that's, that's what I'm trying to, to play with a bit. Steve, I have a question that asks you to go back to your discussion of Smithson. Um, you say that in this, well, around that moment in your talk, and you were talking about how it doesn't amount to photography simply replacing sculpture, even though recent discourses um, get to that idea of this kind of hybrid media form where sculpture is replaced. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that and what the stakes of that look like for you, particularly against the backdrop of your argument about sculpture as centering a community, which of course also comes up in your chapter on Hegel in the Writing Art History book? Yeah. Um, yes, now let me think how I can do that. Um, this becomes a question of, of partly of sort of the difference between Morris and Smith and what displacement means for the two of them. Because um, I think, I think. well, I, I'll, leave, I'll leave the account of Morris to David. Um, but I think Smithson is interested in the relations among mediums, right? He's not interested in overcoming that. He's interested in their capacity for mutual displacement, mutual interference, right? Um, and he is so in part, well, for a lot of reasons. But so that's the argument I want to make about him, that when he sort of, engages a displacement of, from sculpture to photography. It's not because he thinks the one is supplanting the other, but because he's interested in, in extending what in the case of Carroll I referred to very briefly as a kind of acknowledgement of a pictoriality internal to sculpture. Right? Smithson is pushing that. Right? Um, so, so I think Smithson has a stake in something that in an old fashioned way you might call the system of the arts. Thanks so much, Steve.